Good morning. I am told that it is 11 o'clock and it is time to start. It's time for our prelude. And for the last Sunday, we are going to do uh, a gospel song for the prelude. You have it on your insert. If you listen to I've already told the ensemble, if you listen to the sermon, you'll know why. Well, all of these hymns have been chosen. So I'll challenge you, listen to the sermon, and you'll know why. With Oh, how I love Jesus. Let's sing it together. of you have sung these before and we're glad because and hopefully this is um, this is a trip down memory lane but anyway it's summertime the living is easy and and so should be the uh, singing well if you are joining us online welcome to you I should have told you earlier if you would like to have the bulletin and the music and all of the worship aids then you may uh, go to the church's website, it's showing there is uh, on the screen, and you can download it or you can look at it and you can participate with us. I think that that's all of the welcome. We, if you're visiting with us, welcome, and we're glad that you are here. We always hope that those that are visiting with us will read the paragraph entitled, You Are invited that's on the back of the bulletin. We don't sing a song or do anything like that, but we, uh, we always invite you to reconsider your relationship to Jesus Christ. So let us join together in the call to worship. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And also to you. Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. So he is the church's one foundation. That's 321. Let's sing it. Oh 
remain standing for our confession and pardon. The proof of God's amazing love is this. While we were sinners, Christ died for us. Because we have faith in him, we dare to approach God with confidence. In faith and penitence, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Holy, Holy God, God, you see us as we are, and you know our enormous thoughts. We, we confess that we are unworthy of your gracious care. We often forget that all life comes from you, and that to you all life returns. We have not always sought or done your will. We have not lived as grateful children, nor were loved as Christ loved us. Remind us that only your grace can sustain us. Lord, in your mercy, forgive us, heal us, and make us whole. Set us free from sin, and restore to us the joy of your salvation, now and forever. Amen. Hear the good news. Our righteousness is found in Christ alone, a gift of God by faith. Beloved people of God, believe the good news. Through the grace of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thank you, God. The peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And also with you. Please share Christ's peace with those around you. children will come to the front and join Miss Erica up here. She's going to talk to you this morning. You're going to get a break. So, have you guys ever heard the phrase, make lemonade out of lemons? When life gives you lemons, make lemonade. You know what it means? 
when life throws something at you, and like if you ever bit into a lemon, now I know there are people who love to eat lemons, but you do? But they're, but they're kind of tart. They kind of make it And so, so what the meaning of that is, hey, <laughs> is that you want to make lemonade, make something sweet out of something sour. Right? Remember the remember the, the good things. Or as yes. Um but the lemons doesn't but they don't taste sour to me. They don't? Well that's good. That's good. So you probably love lemonade too. Yeah. No? That's too sweet. <laughs> yeah, well. Well, there was a there was a comedy group a number of years ago with it. Some of the folks in the congregation may remember called Money Python. And he had a song from one of their movies, and it was called Always Look on the Bright Side of Life. Always look on the bright side of life. And it's the same kind of thing. When, when something happens, you want to look at the positives. So, for instance, one time, quite a few years ago, my mother was sick. And I had to go help take care of her because there were a lot of things she couldn't do. Well. You know, the bad part was is that my mom was sick. She was getting better, but you know, she had to go through that. But the positive side was, I got to spend time with her. Because I know you guys don't understand that there'll be a time in your lives where you may not live at home. And you won't get to see your mom maybe every single day. And my mother lived in New Jersey, but I was here in Texas. But that was a great time. We played cards together. We did puzzles together. We spent a lot of really good time together. And that was even though the reason for it was something that was not great, something good came out of it. Yes, what's that, Clark? Did your mom get better? She did get better, thank you. Yes, she did get better. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, so that's the idea behind always look on the bright side of life. Do what you can to remember to make things better. Okay? How about if we have a prayer? Okay. Lord, give me a hand that does with speed. Go ahead. Give me a hand that does with speed. The thing that meets my neighbor's need. The thing that meets my neighbor's need. Give me an ear Give that, he an ear. Yeah, that hears a song. That hears a song. When life is hard. When life is hard. And things go wrong. And things go wrong. Give me a tongue. Give me a tongue. That speaks no ill. That speaks no ill. Give me a spirit. Give me a spirit. Of good will. Of good will. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. For being with us. Today. Today. And every day. And every day. Amen. Amen. Thank you, guys. If you have not already done so, will you uh, register your attendance by detaching and signing the registration of attendance slip? If you are online and you're watching live on Facebook, use the comment line to let us know that you are there. We know there's about as many of you out there as there are in here, and so it, uh, it doubles our numbers. And if you will look at the back of the bulletin, that tells you about this week, which is a pretty light week, and, but it also tells you what's coming up as we move through the uh, months ahead with our fellowship. Uh, what is especially on our minds today that um, we heard in the news this morning, there was another little wildfire uh, on Maui. Hopefully they'll get it put out, but we have a... Uh, 
special offering for that, and Greg is our chair of our mission committee is going to share that. Uh, you can stand right there. Uh, as you probably saw in the bulletin, we are collecting a special offering for Presbyterian disaster assistance both this Sunday and next. Certainly the news has carried about the tragic fires, the wildfires in Hawaii, uh, specifically behind Maui. Many of us in this uh, congregation have probably been to that lovely city uh, that's one of the most historic in the entire state uh, that's been devastated. Um, through Presbyterian disaster assistance, we can contribute to uh, moral support and providing basics, water, food, and shelter. Uh, but I do ask, bearing in mind that it's been very highly publicized about the disaster in Maui, there are many others in both our country and the world. And I would ask that we give the uh, Presbyterian Disaster Assistance the uh, ability to designate those funds and allocate them where they are most needed. So if you would make a contribution, you can either use, if you're doing cash, there are envelopes um, in the seat backs, uh, or if you're doing check, just put PDA on it for Presbyterian Disaster Assistance and we'll allocate it appropriately. If any of you have a problem with doing it to the General uh, Presbyterian Disaster Relief Fund and want it allocated specifically for Maui, just let me know and we can handle that. Otherwise, it'll go to the general fund. Thank you, and please be generous. Today, our scripture readings are the, from the lectionary. They are passages for today, and, and the gospel reading gives us that great question that Jesus asked of the disciples at Caesarea Philippi. But it turns out that this is a subject that is really pertinent to some issues of our time, and we're going to talk about those. So listen carefully as we, for the scriptures and then uh, for the sermon, uh, that will talk about some things that are really, really basic to our faith as we talk about the Christian distinction. Speak to us, living God, as you have spoken to our ancestors, through the voices of your prophets, the breath of your spirit, your word, the life of your son, so that we may live accordingly to your word, through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Amen. Our first reading is from the book of Romans. Chapter 12, verses 1 through 8. Please listen for God's word. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of yourself more highly than you ought to think, and to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in, for as in one body, we have many members, and not all members have the same function. So we, who are many, are one body in Christ, and individually we are members of one another. We have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, prophecy in proportion to faith, ministry in ministering, the teacher in teaching, the exhorter in exhortation, the giver in generosity, the leader in diligence, the compassionate in cheerfulness. Here ends the first reading. 
Our New Testament lesson this morning is from the book of Matthew, the 16th chapter, verses 13 through 20. Please listen for God's word. Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, but others Elijah and still others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he sternly ordered the disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. The word of the Lord. Thanks. Thanks. Our next hymn is number 377.
Please be seated. I know that may not be as well known as some other hymns in the book, but it is very pertinent. I need for you to hang in with me today because this is something we're talking about, some things that are very basic to our faith, but there are no cute stories, there are no funny anecdotes, so just, uh, just go on the ride with me. Now, just as most sermons have been, and I haven't made any bones about it, this sermon upon this Matthew 16th text saw its debut sometime before I retired. But I read an article just the other day, and in fact I have seen some variation of the same article in two other publications, one of which was Newsweek since, and it is something that has grabbed my attention. It's something that has shaken me up a little bit, and in my mind, it makes this sermon all the more pertinent. Now, here's part of the article. I'm going to refer to somebody called Russell Moore. I don't know whether you know who Russell Moore is, but Russell Moore is a noted evangelical leader. He was originally ordained in the Southern Baptist Church. He was a uh, professor at Southern Baptist Seminary. He was the chair of the Ethics and Religious Liberty Commission of the Southern Baptist Convention. He now goes to a non-denominational church, but he is, since 2022, the editor of Christianity Today magazine, which is well known in evangelical circles. So now you know who Russell Moore is. Evangelical Christian leader Russell Moore revealed this week that many evangelical pastors have become alarmed that their congregants have become so militant that they are even rejecting the teachings of Jesus Christ. In an interview with NPR, Moore said that multiple pastors had told him disturbing stories about their congregants being upset when they read from the Sermon on the Mount in which Christ espoused the principles of forgiveness and mercy as central to Christian doctrine. And here are his words. Multiple pastors tell me essentially the same story about quoting the Sermon on the Mount, parenthetically, in their preaching, and to have someone come up afterwards and say, where did you get all those liberal talking points? And what was alarming to me is that in most of the scenarios when the pastor would say, I'm literally quoting Jesus Christ, the response would be, would not be, I apologize. The response would rather be, yes, but that doesn't work anymore. That's weak. Moore argues that this has led him to conclude that American evangelical Christianity is now in crisis. My purpose has never was and is not now to ever play the game, my faith is better than your faith. My understanding is better than your understanding. My interpretation is better than your interpretation. Or here's where we're right and others are wrong. I personally find that a rather boring game when a pastor uses it. And I quickly, pretty quickly turn off anyone who is playing it. The purpose of this effort to is affirm something that we consider very basic to our faith. It has been interesting for me to watch over the years the development of the convictions about who is correct about God. There was a time early in the last century when each denomination was correct. There wasn't a lot of movement back and forth among different expressions of the Christian faith. And I know that there are still many who proclaim the way that they have chosen is the only way, but at least they are not in the majority anymore. 
The first movement toward a more ecumenical understanding was a broader statement eh, around the middle of the last century. Well, the church doesn't matter. We all worship the same God and we're trying to get to the same place. So when various denominations realized that their way was not the only way, nor even necessarily was it the best way, not the worst either, but the differences were more of a matter of style and taste than there was a lot more movement between denominations. Now, as the 20th century ended and the 21st century began, there has been more of a broadening of understanding. And so there are some who now say about one religion or another, well, we all worship the same God and we're trying to get to the same place. And with that statement, we maybe are getting a little too broad. Of course, we know that in all people, in all times, there is a universal quest for God. The worship, the, the Evelyn Underhill, he used to work in the last century that wrote a lot about worship, said that in any place you find statues in almost any culture, and you'll find that they're reaching out somehow, they're reaching out for that holy other. It's so there's a universal quest for God, and that is one of the classic proofs for the existence of God, that everybody is trying to find God, is to get hold of God. As we look at the shape that God takes for some, we might have to amend that present statement to say, well, we are all seeking the same reality behind the images that we have of God. This has begun to stir wonder in some people about their faith of their upbringing. William Willimon was the chaplain at Duke University and he told of the incident of a young woman who came in to him to explain to her the difference between Christianity and Judaism. See, she was in love with a Jewish student they were both law students. They were thinking about marriage. How could they deal with the differences in their two related but disparate faiths? The chaplain and the student discussed rituals and festivals and beliefs, but then she asked the chaplain a more fundamental question. When it comes down to it, what is the one thing that makes Christians Christian? And the answer is not potluck dinners, nor WWJD bracelets, or even pushy preachers. The Christian distinctive, the thing that makes us who we are, is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is Christianity. You see, other faiths it, embrace the concept of love, and they may have beliefs about the good and the true, but only Christianity has Jesus. If, if God had given us only a book, then we would have a Bible, but we wouldn't necessarily be Christians. We would be another noble philosophy of life or a system of ethical values. But it is the audacious claim that God did come to us in the flesh as a Jew from Nazareth named Jesus. The name Jesus is derivative of the Hebraic Joshua, which means God saves. We believe that in a peculiar way that God saves, gets to us, gets us through Jesus. It is our understanding that as we look at this Jewish carpenter's son who was born and lived a relatively brief time, died violently in his 30s, and unexpectedly rose from the dead, 
In him we see God as clearly as our finite minds are able to see. Now, there are those who look at Jesus and they may see mostly a noble teacher, a, a great moral example, or even as a revolutionary. After all, from the very beginning, who Jesus was and what he was about was far from self-evident. Jesus was the hoped for Messiah of Jewish expectation <laughs> And yet he didn't act like a Messiah ought to act, and he didn't always talk like a Messiah ought to talk. Jesus didn't directly say who he was. He did not go around wearing a t-shirt that said, Son of God. Messiahs are supposed to have power, take charge, set things right, fix all of our problems. Jesus never did browbeat others into following him. He refused to dominate. He refused to take up arms. Jesus sort of reinterpreted God, who God is, and what God wants from humankind. And eventually Jesus was killed for doing the things he did and saying the things he said but from a Roman perspective, he was certainly not executed for walking around saying, I am God. Now, with that, let's come to this Matthew 16 passage that forms our gospel reading for today. After those original disciples had heard and watched and walked with Jesus for a while, before he could complete his mission and leave them with their marching orders, it was time to see what they believed. So they came to the district of Caesarea Philippi and where he would give them an oral exam. Uh, Caesarea Philippi is a city in northern Palestine on the southern slope of Mount Hermon. Uh, in antiquity, Caesarea Philippi was a site for pagan Baal worship. When the Romans came to the land, Augustus Caesar gave it to King Herod. And it was Herod's son Philip who renamed it Caesarea Philippi, not only to honor Caesar, but to honor himself. This is the setting for this big question. And it was the symbol of both pagan culture and foreign domination. It was here that Jesus asked the disciples, first of all, who do people say that I am? And the disciples' answers were all over the map. Some say John the Baptist, the loner who preached fiery wrath, the forerunner of the Messiah. Some say Elijah. Last time we saw him, he was heading up for heaven in a fiery chariot. His return would be a prelude to the arrival of the Messiah, but he was not. Elijah was not the Messiah. Some say Jeremiah, one of the greatest prophets Israel ever produced, but still not the word made flesh. And people are still all over the map when it comes to Jesus. We all, we do all sorts of good and unfortunately sometimes do all sorts of evil in the name of Jesus. And it should concern us that sometimes we try to mold Jesus in our image rather than molding ourselves into his. But then Jesus asked, and this is the pertinent question for today, but you, who do you say? that I am. And it was Peter, impulsive Peter, sometimes the candidate for the least likely to succeed disciple. It was Peter who got it right. Peter made a career of saying sometimes the worst thing at the worst possible time. And yet he's the one who now said, you are the Messiah. 
You are the son of the living God. You know, I think Jesus might have felt comfortable at this moment with the words of Professor Henry Higgins when he, what he said to Eliza Doolittle in My Fair Lady in his, in My Fair Lady in his response, "By Jove, I think he's got it." Now, Peter still had a long way to go. A little later, he was arguing with Jesus about Jesus' announcement about the cross. We'll yeah, talk about that a little next week. Later, Peter let Jesus down. Peter even denied Jesus when the chips were down. Peter didn't have that much faith in the resurrection, and after the crucifixion, he went back to his old summertime job. But at this moment, Peter did hit the nail on the head about the Christian distinctive. It is believing in Jesus, following Jesus, having a relationship with Jesus, doing what he did. So then let's briefly look at the implications of this Christian distinctive. First of all, Jesus shapes the Christian image and the understanding about God. Let me give a couple of analogies. Back in uh, colonial days, the furniture makers would travel from place to place to try to uh, sell their wares. They didn't build much on speculation and whether you were on a horse or even a small wagon, it was difficult to carry uh, one or more full-size pieces along. So what they would do, they would make a miniature that would illustrate uh, their style and display their skill. It was from a miniature sample that people would know what the craftsman was like. In a similar vein, I was once at a funeral where a minister was trying to give a eulogy for someone he didn't know and in fact had never met. And he said to the congregation, I didn't know the father, but I've known the son. And from what I've seen of the son, I'm impressed. If a son is an accurate reflection of the father, then you can know the father through him. Well, now both of these are obviously imperfect examples, but they reveal something to us about the Christian distinctive. See, for Christians, the image, the shape, the nature, the character of God is known through Jesus. Jesus may not have been all that there is to God, but he is a representation that we can see and understand with our limited facilities. Here's the second thing. Jesus is the standard by which we read all of the Bible. The Reformed faith has historically put a great emphasis on the Bible as the revelation of the nature and the will of God. But the Reformed faith has never placed the Bible with a divinity of its own, sort of a fourth person of the Trinity. There are many ways in which the Bible is used and many ways in which it's often abused. Uh, I guess we are all draw drawn to the portions that say what we want them to say. One of the things that drove Mark Twain from the church was the way in which southern ministers he heard speak dealt with the Bible and the issue of slavery. And here's what he said. They talked as though God actually approved of the practice. And if there were passages that appeared to the contrary, they were not read by our pastor. How could they lie so? And then he said with a twinkle in his eye, the result of practice, no doubt. Now, when we want a rough way to deal with wrongdoers, 
our enemies. We're quick to turn to the Old Testament. An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. It's right there in the Bible just as God said it. And if there are passages that seem to the contrary, we may choose not to read those. How can we lie so? Even if just to ourselves. There's a whole theological perspective that divides time into segments. They call them dispensations and teaches that God deals unique with uniquely with each one. But the Reformed faith has held that for Christians, the standard by which all scripture is interpreted is interpreted through the one who is the word made flesh. To ferret out the word of God, to find what we have called the norms within the forms, Christians must read all of the Bible through the life and the teaching of Jesus the Christ to get an accurate image of who God is and what God wants of humankind. And then here's the other one. Jesus is the measure of what human life at its best ought to be. Who do you say that I am determines whether Jesus has any relevance in your life, whether he shapes your thinking, whether he influences your behavior. I remember several years ago looking at a news summary on the internet, and the story was of the videotapes that uh, were found that confirmed much about the Al-Qaeda network. And they included a declaration of war by the then leader, Osama bin Laden. He was saying on the tapes, in effect, by the, wor the word of the most wise, powerful, and merciful God, you are to go out and inconvenience, disrupt, cause suffering to, and kill crusaders and Jews and Americans. In this kind of thinking, the most merciful God sends his henchmen out to create havoc, destruction, and death to anyone who does not think and believe like us. And that ain't God, as we know God. This is why we must differentiate between worshiping the same God or seeking the same reality behind the image of God that we have. Christians have a very clear distinctive. Jesus the Christ. It is Jesus who shapes our image about God. It is Jesus who interprets the whole of the word of God. It is Jesus who teaches and shows us what the abundance of life should be. Jesus says just a few verses after Peter's confession, if any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For some who at one point would worship and adore Jesus and yet turn around and say in their deeds, if not in their words, that doesn't work anymore that's weak, then we can only cry out what the Apostle Paul once said to the Galatians. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another gospel, but there are some who are confusing you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. Paul exhorts the Christians at Rome, at Rome and us, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds so that you can discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. 
Here's the bottom line. In some mystical way, by his spirit, a relationship with Christ is possible. It is a relationship that can change who you are, how you think, and the way you live. It is a relationship that leads us to a God that with the infinite God that with our finite human faculties we cannot completely grasp because we are limited. But we can still know much about God. That is a relationship that is available to you. So the question that comes ringing down through Matthew to all of us today, who do you say that he is? Thanks be to God. And now, will you join with hundreds of years of disciples who have been affirming their faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed? Stand and let's join them as we affirm our faith using those words. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. And it is into those hands, those loving hands of that loving, gracious God that Jesus revealed to us that welcomes our coming, that welcomes our praying. So let's open our hearts as we offer our prayers to Almighty God. You open the gates of heaven, O oh God, and we catch a sight of your eternal order. Your way of righteousness and peace is made known in Jesus. Your commandments become our guide and direction in how to discern your will. Jesus has shown us what it means to obey. He has made what was hidden now known. As the light, he illumines our way and we continue to dwell in your mercy. And we thank you for the sustaining presence of your Holy Spirit. Through the guidance of that spirit, we seek to fulfill what you wish us to be. We pray for our nation and for the role we perform as citizens. Help us to take responsibility for our actions so that others become able to respond. Keep us from ignoring those who are in need, either because we are greedy or we think them inferior. Guide us to measure our own benevolence by the magnitude of your love. When we read of issues that confront us, keep us from complacency and apathy. Help us to assist those who are elected to office, those we have entrusted to govern, both in civil affairs and in the church. We pray for the leaders of our country and for other nations as well. Give them a sense of humility amid the powers they exercise. Endow them with respect for each other so that all people can dwell in the hope that peace and justice can prevail. Lord, give an extra measure of grace to the sick, the distressed, 
the confused, and the lost. And hear now in our silence the prayers which we hold deep within our innermost being. O oh God, we have been led to acknowledge Christ Jesus as the source of new life. Give us a vision of your presence with us. As you have called us to be your people, we come before you offering ourselves that your message may be spread from east and west and from north and south. Lead our descendants to proclaim you God of their lives. Hear our prayers through the one who left us this beautiful prayer which we pray together saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now, our response. Well, our response is how we live, what we do when we leave this place. But our immediate response is to return to God the offerings of our life and the gifts of the earth. Do good and share what you have, for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. Almighty and merciful God, from whom comes all that is good, we praise you for your mercies, for your goodness that has created us, your grace that has sustained us, your discipline that has corrected us, your patience that has borne with us, and your love that has redeemed us. Help us to love you and to be thankful for all your gifts by serving you and delighting to do your will through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Our closing hymn, Oh, for a Thousand Tongues to Sing.
us go in peace to love and serve the Lord. The Lord be with you. And also with you. The grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all, both now and forever. And let all God's people say, Amen. Amen.